Several years ago, I was trying to figure out what in the world I was supposed to do as a dad of three daughters. Someone recommended a book to me uh, on teaching your children how to make good choices, to take responsibility and ownership of their lives so that as they grow up, they've learned how to make good choices. The authors talked about low-cost lessons versus high-cost lessons. The idea was that uh, you would present your children with a choice, you know, that you need to make a choice, and I'm going to help you with these options that you have, and then I'm going to let you make a decision. And, uh, of course, there are some things that you can allow them to make even a a poor choice so that they learn the lesson. That would be a a low-cost lesson. An example of that might be a few weeks ago when it was, you know, in the 30s in the morning before school and your child comes, you know, maybe downstairs dressed and ready to go to school in shorts, right? And you're like, I don't think that was the best choice of attire for school today. You know it's 30-something degrees outside and mothers of boys, you know, they're just looking at you like, yeah, yeah, (laughs) of course, this is fine, you know? Maybe you've... uh, You've seen your child about to run out the door without a jacket on when it's cold outside, and you're like, there's an option there where you can step in and go, you need to put a coat on, you know, go get your coat. Or you can stop and help them try to make a good choice, right? And if they decide not to make a good choice and that they don't need that jacket, well, perhaps they'll learn that uh, it's really cold outside, and that jacket would have kept them warm. These are examples of low-cost lessons. But, of course, there are some lessons that are just too high a cost. We can't just let them learn those on their own. They don't get to experience firsthand how dangerous it is to run out into traffic on a busy street. Your littles don't get to run around a pool without their puddle jumper on when they don't know how to swim. They have to hold your hand when you're in a huge crowd where they could easily get separated from you and lost. When the cost goes up, so does your intensity as a parent, right? Several years ago, I took my family to a place on Signal Mountain called Falling Water Falls. Super clever name. It was a waterfall called Falling Water Falls. Um, I don't know. Has anybody been there? Anybody been there? Okay, a few of you have been to Falling Water Falls. It's, it's, it's incredibly beautiful, and it's incredibly dangerous, You're basically walking along the trail, and then all of a sudden, you're on the edge of the mountain. This was a video I took. I was standing on the edge of the mountain. There are no fences. There are no signs. There is no warning. Just bam, and you're there. (laughs) So... Thankfully, I had been warned before we went there. So when we got out of the car, I had a serious talk with my kids about staying with me and listening to me and doing everything I say. And when we got closer to those falls and we could hear the water rushing, I let them know in no uncertain terms, if they did not obey me, something terrible would happen. We get this as parents. When our kids are running toward a cliff or danger, we yell, stop, right? It's almost scary, the intensity in our voice. Perhaps even our faces reflect just how dangerous the situation is. And I say that today because many of us are parents and we get this. And as we continue our study of Second Peter today, we're going to receive a serious warning from our Heavenly Father. Grave, serious, strong words are going to be used. And it's because the stakes are so high. But before we get there, I know it's been a few weeks. I know that some of us are new and just just jumping in. And so I want to do a little review for where we've been and set some context. We're studying the New Testament letter of 2 Peter. This was written by the Apostle Peter, who was one of the closest disciples to Jesus during his life and his ministry. Peter's writing from a Roman prison sometime between 64 and 67 AD. 
He's waiting to be executed by the emperor Nero. So these are some of his last words. And what does he want his audience to know? Keep growing. Keep growing. That's his message. Each week we've pointed to the key verse in this letter, 2 Peter 3.18. He says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. The theme of chapter 1 could be summed up as remember. And we've covered this ground already. Peter says, remember, in verse 3, you've been given everything you need for eternal life and godliness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, he says in verse 4, you've been given God's precious and very great promises. So hold on to those. Remember, you've been called to make every effort to grow in Christ-like qualities. And he, he lists several of those in verses 5 through 11. And then remember, hold on to the word of God like a lamp shining in the dark. Remember, Peter says, because we are a forgetful people. But also remember the truth of the gospel because there are lies and false teaching all around us. If the theme of chapter 1 is remember, then the theme of chapter 2 is warning. Warning. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to 2 Peter. It's toward the the back of your Bible or it's toward the bottom of the list if you're dialing it up on a on a phone or some type of device. We're going to have it on the screen if you want to follow along. But since 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 begins with a but, we should back up and grab a couple of verses for some context. So let's start 2 Peter 1 verse 19. Peter says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So if you remember, Peter was talking about his eyewitness account, his walking with Jesus, his testimony had value and worth, but also he pointed to the prophetic word of God. He's saying we need to hold on to the word of God, like a lamp that's shining in a dark place. And he's saying that these prophecies, these are not things that are just created by the will of man. These are things that are being spoken by the Holy Spirit through human authors. Then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Peter says that there were Old Testament false prophets. You might remember some of the stories of the the showdown between the prophets of Baal and the true prophet Elijah. You might remember the Old Testament books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're full of instances where God is calling out false prophets who were just speaking to the people what they wanted to hear. These false prophets were making a living off these prophecies, soothing kings instead of warning them about the sin of the people. And just as these false prophets arose back then, Peter's saying there will be false teachers among you in your churches, in churches all around you, and all around the world. And just in case they weren't sure just how serious of a threat this was, listen to the words that Peter uses to describe these false teachers and their teaching over the next 21 verses. Sensuality, greed, false words, unrighteous, indulging in lust, despising authority, irrational animals, creatures of instinct, ignorant 
blots and blemishes, eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, accursed children, waterless springs, slaves of corruption. Those are strong words. These false teachers were a serious threat to God's people for a few reasons. Number one, they were a threat because they are among you. They're posing as Christians. They might not even consider themselves posers. They believe in what they're selling. Peter says they're secretly bringing in destructive heresies. That word secretly means to introduce in a sneaky or a a, a private way. They're, They're starting to tell others that they have some insight that not everyone else has. Like, there's another way to think about this and interpret this. I have some experience that might change your mind about what God says. Secret knowledge. Another reason these false teachers were a threat to God's people is because they were popular. Look at verse 2. Peter says, many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasted. The way of truth, God's truth, will will be spoken poorly about, will be misrepresented, will be distorted. Peter's saying there's a movement that's happening. In verse 14, he says they're enticing unsteady souls. So they might have been going after new believers. They might have been going after people that weren't yet fully grounded in the gospel. Or perhaps they're struggling with overcoming some sin. And these false teachers were coming in and recruiting them. And many were following them. The Apostle Paul talked about this too in the first century. In Romans 16, he says that, These false teachers deceive hearts with smooth talk and flattery. You might think that false teachers sound like Voldemort or Darth Vader. Maybe they roll up into the church parking lot in a creepy panel van. But the reality is they look and sound like me. Way cooler than me, I'm sure. And taller, certainly. Still. Look at all the views and likes they have on their reels and social media popping up all over your feeds. Perhaps what they're saying is true. Everyone seems to be liking it. It's a threat because they are among us, operating under the banner of Christian. It's a threat because many are following. And it's a threat because of their sensuality. That Greek word literally means unbridled lust. They're promoting the passions of the flesh with no boundaries, no limitations. Sex, money, approval. Verse 19, Peter says that they're promising freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Some of the false teaching that Peter's audience is facing centers around the idea that there's not going to be a final judgment. There will not be accountability. Jesus is not coming back. He's going to address that in chapter 3. We'll get there. But because Jesus is not coming back again, there's not going to be a judgment. This is all kind of a spiritual thing. This is about an enlightened state of freedom to follow whatever you feel. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. Jesus came to set us free from all of that. Does this sound familiar? Of course, this ultimately leads to sinful and destructive behavior. And so God delivers through Peter a very clear and certain warning. And this is the warning. Judgment is coming. 
And he does this by giving three examples of how God has brought judgment on sin in the past. He talks about the angels who rebelled against God. He talks about the ancient world that was so wicked, God had to flood the earth. And he talks about the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Peter's point is this. If God did not spare these from judgment, he will not spare the false teachers either. Nor will he spare anyone who rejects him and does not come underneath his authoritative will and word. He starts with the angels in verse 4. And this whole section, verses 4 through 10, is kind of a big if-then statement. He's going to say, if God would do this, then he will do that. If God would do this, then he will do that. We're going to see it unfold. Verse 4, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. He's talking about angels, these glorious created beings created by God with tremendous beauty and worth to worship God. And yet all that beauty and that worth was no use. God did not spare his wrath when they rebelled against him. And Peter says they're being held in the deepest pit of hell. Literally, a place that the ancients called Tartarus. Think about this when you think about humanity with arguably even more dignity and more worth because we're created in the image of God. But no amount of dignity and worth is going to spare us from God's judgment if we deny and reject the worth and work of Jesus. No inherent worth will spare us. We need to say that because, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, in our culture today, the, the doctrine or the belief that the Bible tells us that we are born into sin is eroding away. Our culture is saying, no, 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 we are born innocent. The Bible says, no, we are born into sin. Children of wrath, which is what makes the gospel such good news. God has made a way to rescue us from that. Peter continues with the next example in verse 5. If God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He's talking about Genesis chapter 6, where we learn that the Lord saw the wickedness of man that it was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was just evil continually. So God decided he was going to destroy it. I think it's interesting here that Noah, the one who was walking with God, the one who was spared the destruction, Noah's called a herald of righteousness. It might have taken Noah about 120 years to build the ark. So you can imagine the people who would have come by and just started asking him, hey, Noah, what are you doing? Like, what are you working on? You're continuing to build this giant boat in the middle of nowhere. It's been 100 years. What are you doing? You can imagine Noah trying to explain it to them. But no one believed that God would flood the earth. Maybe they couldn't even imagine that a God would do such a thing. But he did. And Peter is saying, this was God's judgment for sin. This was his wrath. It's real. And you won't be spared just because you can't believe in a God who would do such a thing. The final example is Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. The false teachers were saying, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. 
if following God's design for sexuality doesn't matter. And Peter is saying, remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18 tells us that God came to Abraham and said, the sin of these cities is so grievous that I must destroy them. Ezekiel 16 says these cities were arrogant, overfed, they didn't help the poor, and they did detestable things. And Jude 7 says that Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves to sexual immorality and unnatural desire. Peter's saying these false teachers are going to lead you down a path of destruction. And God has brought his righteous wrath and judgment against sin. Specifically in this last example of Sodom and Gomorrah against sexual sin. And Peter's point is, he will do so again. I think in these verses, it's like Peter's trying to paint three pictures for us. To help us understand. There are these pictures of judgment for sin. And yet in two of them that involve humanity, there's also in the midst of this destruction and judgment, there is salvation for those who follow God. Verse 9 and 10 are the culmination of this. If God didn't spare the angels, but threw them in to the deepest pit of hell, if God did not spare the ancient world and their wickedness, but destroyed them, but saved Noah, If God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, but saved Lot and his family, verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So here's what this means. Peter's telling his audience The popularity of false teaching is going to lead to confusion and division all around you. And that means there's going to be pressure on those who hold on to God's word as authoritative. There's going to be pressure on those who believe in a resurrected Christ who will return and judge humanity. There's going to be pressure on those who hold to God's design for sex and marriage and gender and created purpose. There will be pressure, but take heart. The Lord knows how to rescue his people from these trials. And he knows how to punish the unrighteous. Especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and who despise authority. We're going to get more into what that looks like in our context next week, but quickly. We're living in a world that desperately needs Jesus, the real Jesus, the true King Jesus. In our culture here in the West, the secular thinking or mindset that's infiltrating the church is saying, you're good. You are inherently good, and therefore what you feel and what you desire, whatever your heart is leading you toward, it must be good, and no one, not God or anyone else, can judge you for that. That's leading us to this word sensuality, this unbridled lust, this no limits, no boundaries, no constraints. It's raising up new generations with an unbiblical sexual ethic. It's loosely based on consent, not on covenant, and not on God's authoritative design. And our secularism is trying to dethrone God because our sinful flesh despises authority. Just like Peter said was happening in the first century, it's happening today. And we're being taught that if anyone tells you what you don't like or asks you to do something you don't want to do, you can and should reject it. You going your own way is celebrated as brave and courageous. And it might be in certain cases. But the Bible is clear that we've all gone our own way like sheep that have gone astray. 
And so Jesus came to take upon himself all the wrath and the judgment due us for that. To make us free from our sin. Free from those unfettered desires. Free to follow him. And to trust his way. So what? When I was up on Signal Mountain with my kids, we were about to go enjoy something breathtaking and beautiful. And at the very same time, there were dangers. I had to have a moment of real seriousness. I mean, it was, it was stark. I, I basically looked at them in the eye and said, do not think you can run off from me up here. And I imagined them, them like turning to me and, and saying, gosh, Dad, you're so serious. You're kind of mean. I just don't know if I can listen to you right now. That's the spirit of our age. That's losing sight of the heart of our Heavenly Father. Who's made a way to rescue us from ourselves. Who's made a, a way to rescue us from our brokenness, from our innate desire to rebel against him, to, to, to distrust him, to not want anyone to tell us what we can and can't do. And so God gives us this, this gracious, precious warning. He's saying, don't get caught up in the teaching that will lead you to sin and pain and destructive consequences. Don't surround yourself or fill your feeds with people who will tell you only what you want to hear or soothe you into thinking that this life is all about you. Instead, grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as revealed in God's Word. Instead, grow in the discipline of dying to yourself and those desires and living for the kingdom of God in the purpose that he has designed for you. Grow in the disciplines of Bible study and trying to better understand God's word and his will for your life and do that in community like our life groups and our Bible study so that, that you're checked when, when you kind of got a maybe a, 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 an off version of what you think this is saying, or perhaps you've heard something that isn't entirely true. Jesus came, lived a sinless life so that he could be a perfect sacrifice on our behalf so that we could be forgiven of our sin, not let loose into our sin so that we could begin to live free from our sinful desires and to make life about Him, not about us. And so that's why it's so important that we come to the table of communion, so that we can be reminded of this, reminded of the gospel and the hope that we have, reminded of, of the need that we have and how God came and filled it, reminded of the love of our Heavenly Father, even when he gets stirred and warning us, reminded of the sacrifice and the cost that was our salvation, reminded of the hope that we have, even in our world that is lost. Even in the midst of darkness, we have a hope and we carry this hope into the world with us, and it's a hope that's offered to anyone who would come because Jesus said, I will not turn anyone away who comes to me. So we come to remember. And in a moment, I'm going to pray, but before we do that, this is a family meal. This is for those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. We've, sur we've surrendered to him and we struggle and we trip and we fall down and we skin our knees and we blow it, but we know that there's grace for our sin. And so we get back up and we continue to grow in that grace and that knowledge of Jesus. This meal is for us.
You don't have to be a member of Two Rivers Church, just a member of the family of God. To come here to the table and take the bread that represents the body of Christ that's broken for you. To dip it in the cup, which represents the blood that was poured out for you. Which sealed a new promise that you will never pay the full penalty for your sin. We take this in faith and trust that it nourishes us and reminds us of the gospel, of the truth about who we are and who God is. So will you stand with me as I pray? Father, we thank you for your word and for the gospel. I pray, God, that you would continue to teach us the truth and that you would protect us here in this family at Two Rivers Church and those that we love that are near and dear to us. Would you protect us from false teaching and from following ideas that lead us away from you and into destruction? Would you give us wisdom and discernment, God? Would you teach us from your word? Would you enrich our community as we gather and meet together to worship and, and study and talk about life and share our struggles and, and share the gospel with one another? Would you strengthen us and establish us in the truth that we could be lights in a dark world? Nourish us and strengthen us with this meal now, we pray. In Jesus' name.